In the American zone, which has neither the industrial nor the agricultural resources to exist independently, the U.S. military government is working to prepare the Germans for a resumption of their national existence. But the first aim is to make sure that they can never again wage war. Americans are discovering that the Germans are still far from ready to settle down as a peaceful and law-abiding people. Military police are kept busy rounding up gun runners who smuggle weapons to secret bands of Nazi diehards. Still hiding out in the cellars of ruined towns and cities are werewolf gangs, young fanatics who were Hitler's most emotional idolaters and who have inherited the dream of a Nazi Reich greater and more powerful than ever. Every zone of Germany is plagued with the black market, an institution which absorbs so much of what little the U.S. zone produces that it has become a serious threat to economic recovery. American occupation soldiers are themselves the chief suppliers of cigarettes, long the favored medium of exchange. In Berlin, as well as in the American zone, the German police stage periodic raids. But though these raids have given German policemen a chance to express their aggressiveness and authority in roughening up their fellow countrymen, the raids have had little effect. Far more complex and delicate a task than coping with the black market is the job of denazification undertaken by the U.S. military government. On trial or awaiting trial before special German courts are some two million indicted Nazis. Penalties for the guilty range from long terms at hard labor for the worst offenders to fines for those less culpable. Though inevitably some have escaped just punishment, the denazification courts have set aside from the German body politic great numbers of Hitler's followers and cleared the way for the democratic experiment the U.S. Army is attempting under the direction of General Lucius D. Clay. In our zone of Germany, we have moved consistently forward in establishing local government through electoral procedures. We believe that democracy can be established in Germany, but only if the German people again become interested in self-government through democratic processes. At American instigation, the Germans have developed new political parties. Though historically unsuccessful at democratic government, the Germans are today mechanically going through the motions of democracy. Attending election rallies as an appeasement gesture, they find them strangely unexciting, sadly lacking in the fire and fury of Nazi rabble-rousing. In their first free elections, the Germans of the American zone voted in most of the candidates the Christian Democratic Party had put forward not without some regard as to their ability to win favor with the occupation authorities. For all the lip service Germans pay to democracy, for all their servile friendliness of manner, the U.S. military government faces no obstacle more subtle than the inherent arrogance of an egotistical people. More immediate than the need for rebuilding Germany's political structure, was that of rebuilding its economy, beginning with its transportation system. For the German network of railroads links not only Germany, but the greater part of Europe. Despite shortages of material and labor, much progress has been made. With industries getting underway, the Germans have begun to provide themselves with jobs, as well as with some needed goods, which would otherwise have to be supplied by the United States. In 1947, much of the slowly reviving industry in the American zone is being concentrated on goods for export, with the full encouragement of the American military government. For only by building up on a big scale the export of German consumer goods can Germany get off relief and contribute its share to the European economy.
Whatever the Americans can achieve, it is in the British zone that the whole problem of Germany's economic rehabilitation centers. For in this zone, with its teeming population, is the most highly concentrated industrial center in the world, the Ruhr district, whose coal and steel production is basic to the economy not only of Germany, but of most of Europe as well. Wrecked beyond repair is the great Krupp munitions works at Essen, prime producer of armaments for the Nazis. But this plant is an exception. 75% of the Ruhr industrial plants survived the war, and many of them are operating today under British supervision, though their output is only a fraction of what it was. For iron and steel production, transport and power all depend upon coal, and Britain has been unable to build up the output of Ruhr coal to meet requirements. In a normal peacetime year, the Ruhr produced 128 million tons, of which some 30 million went for export. In 1946, production amounted to less than half of normal, of which 20% was shipped to France and the Low Countries, leaving a totally inadequate supply in Germany. The Ruhr's low rate of coal production is basically a labor problem. The mines are manned today chiefly by the young and unskilled, or the old and tired. Most of the others were killed or taken prisoner in the war, while great numbers of experienced supervisors were disqualified as Nazis. The amount the miners can produce is diminished by undernourishment, which produces illness and absenteeism, and reduces their efficiency when they're on the job. For though an increased ration has been allotted the miners out of Britain's own meager food supply, the men all too often share it with their families instead of benefiting by it themselves. Keeping miners on full time is another major problem, for a few days' work gives them enough to buy the week's rations to which they are entitled. Many of the other days they spend hunting for additional food at farms outside the cities, where they barter soap or whatever else they may be able to spare. For the lack of a few essential commodities, German recovery has been seriously retarded. By late 1946, it had become clear to Washington that Germany's tardy recovery was jeopardizing the whole economic future of Europe. And to Secretary Burns, it was clear that some start must be made toward unifying Germany with or without the agreement of France and Russia. Representatives of Great Britain and the US laid down a unification plan for their two zones as advocated by General Clay. The United States is spending $200 million a year in supporting the German economy. Britain is spending twice as much by unifying the two zones and investing a billion dollars jointly to get the German economy functioning again, we can have the whole area self-supporting within three years. That may seem like a lot of money, but I can assure you it will pay us in the end. The British and Americans were confident that this agreement could induce Russia to alter its attitude of opposition to unification. For necessary as were the agricultural resources of the Russian zone to the British and Americans, even more desirable to Russia were the industrial resources of the Ruhr. On sharing these depends Russia's only hope of collecting the huge annual reparations which he has claimed. That unifying Germany and restoring its industrial capacity may restore its war potential, the Allies are aware. But at least America is resolved to continue the occupation until the Germans give conclusive evidence of regeneration, if necessary for 40 years. For of adult Germans deeply affected by Nazism, little can be expected. Any hope that Germany will ever become a responsible, peace-loving nation centers on the very young, who have not been corrupted by Hitler's doctrines of treachery and aggression, who may still be taught that Germany can find greatness only through freedom and democracy, in peaceful cooperation with the rest of mankind. Time marches on. Time marches on.